All right, we're live. Uh, Captain Joe Sicchetti, uh, a friend, leader, uh, and way more than that, is I'm happy to have you on the School of Fish uh, conversation today. Well, uh, thank you, John. I'm glad to be here, and I love that you're getting the word out to people and uh, and talking about things that are interesting and cool topics. Yes, you. I, I hope to have other captains, but there's a, a good chance that you will be one of our only captains. The honor of having an Army Ranger captain does not ha happen every day. So, Joe, maybe for the audience, give a little bit of background on your history uh, and kind of where you're from, what you've done, and even maybe leading up to what you're doing today. Oh, thanks, John. I'd love to. And, and thanks for the, um, the, the props. Uh, which I will accept on behalf of all my brothers in the uh, in the armed services, brothers and sisters, I should say. Uh, uh, the armed services are a great place to be. Uh, I got lucky, and I spent uh, some time uh, in the uh, in the military in in, uh, in special operations. Uh, and uh, a lot of people know what these things are, but uh, you've heard U.S. Army Ranger. That is an elite fighting force that uh, that the military has. Uh, it gave me the chance to. Um, to forge leadership practices under the crucible of fire and uh, a couple of tours in Iraq. And I had the luck to, uh, 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 to lead troops there, uh, recon element and the 82nd other Rangers. Um, and it's, it's a great mission that they, that they have. Uh, and uh, we've, we've been, you know, we've been at uh, in conflict for, for some time now. Uh, but what, what is very fascinating is that I think that the best leaders that are coming out of, uh, uh, you know, of anywhere, any, any crucible uh, are guys in the military. So I uh, graduated college. I uh, did some grad school. I went, I was ROTC. I had a scholarship. Uh, so I owed them four years. I decided, let me do everything I possibly can. That's exciting. And so I, I signed up for the infantry and then I signed up for the airborne and then ranger school. And I was lucky enough to make it through. And then it, that led to a, a, you know, a really awesome career. And uh, fortunately, uh, I was able to get over to Iraq and bring all 40 guys that I uh, that I took over there uh, back home. And Joe, when, when, when someone just just for the novice um, person that's not an expert in the armed services, particularly in, in the army, uh, talk to me about to become a captain uh, in terms of where that falls on the, the spectrum of titling within the armed services, within the army. Yeah. And two is like, what are the kind of high level credentials to even reach that, that pinnacle of a title? Well, to uh, become an officer, uh, you've got officer ranks and enlisted ranks. It's this dual structure that's been around since Roman times. Um, you've got uh, enlisted ranks that are, you know, the, the enlisted to officer ratio is about 80-20. 80% 20. Uh, 80 of the military, in this case, we'll just talk Army because that's where I'm from, 80% uh, are enlisted. Uh, those are, those are frontline troops. And then they have a hierarchy that goes up through sergeant and then a lot of grades of sergeant up to all the way up to sergeant major. And then you have officers and officers are in charge of these units. Um, so, uh, uh, the lieutenant is the uh, is the the first officer. In, in order to do that, because you asked about qualifications, yep. you uh, you have to have a college degree. Uh, you have to have studied uh, the in the army for four years, and that's either through West Point or through college ROTC. And during that time, you learn a lot about military history, uh, troops, strategy. Uh, you also learn about tactics, how to lead people, uh, and then you get your commission, and then. You become a second lieutenant, and then if you get lucky enough, you get uh, and you hang around the army, you get promoted to captain. And then each level that you get promoted, you're in charge of more people. So, and by the way, it goes far beyond captain. Thank you for the honor. There it goes to major, colonel, and general. After that, no, it's it's really interesting. I I don't know if I ever shared this with you, but when I was at the University of Wisconsin senior year a group of my friends signed up for i believe it was called military science uh in the rotc program in madison so i i spent one one semester studying military science i was an international relations major um so i've i've been you know curious about world order and foreign policy dating back almost 25 years 
Um, give, give a sense on when the, the period of time in, in which you served, just as a reference. Yeah, I was in, in the uh, late 80s and 90s, right around uh, the, the Gulf War, uh, Iraq first time around. So Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm happened in 1990 and 91. And my years of service were 85, which when I graduated college, to 94 after I got out of active duty and even did some reserve time after that. And, you know, obviously there's there's many, I'm sure, life lessons and, and things that you could draw from. I heard you say before, you know, it, it prepares you to enter the business world. But uh, talk to me about some of the life skills that really stand out in some of the day to day that, that you're in today in the technology industry or in just you know the co company corporate world. That's a great question, because I think the one thing that really, uh, really shines with folks that are, have spent time in the military and then even more so in folks that uh, have, have been in a combat zone, led troops uh, or been in special operations is this incredible ability to, uh, to do a lot of thinking about leadership. I mean, they think about leadership because in the Army, um, when you're uh, you know, behind enemy lines, you've got uh, the lives of your men at stake. And so every little decision is is uh, is pretty important. You know, whether you go left or right uh, sometimes means whether guys are going to die or not. And so you get a chance to learn a lot of lessons. And what I found was that tw 20 years later, after I got out of the army, these lessons were super impactful. And so, you know, I, you may you know this already, uh, but I wrote them down in a book uh, called Guts, Smarts and Love. And it's full of vignettes that answer the question you just asked. So little lessons like. If you want to be a leader, you have to walk the walk. And sometimes uh, you create a persona. Um, you, want, you want to be on mission with your boys. Um, you're, you want to uh, uh, set the example or uh, position your team for survival. All those little vignettes I just said, there happen to be chapters in the book uh, that, uh, that talk about that, that exact thing. So there's just a ton of things that that go now, you know, of course, in the army uh, during wartime, the, the stakes are super high. Uh, the stakes are life and death. You either come home from the mission or you don't. Um, uh, but they, they're still super applicable in, in the corporate world, don't you think? Because, um, you know, uh, it, there's wins and losses and great financial gain to be had. Uh, and just shy of, you know, not we're not losing our life if we lose a deal, but we're, we're, we might lose our livelihood. Yeah. Uh, from a leadership standpoint, you, I listen to a lot of podcasts, I read a lot, I speak to a lot of people. The term leadership is something that could mean a lot of different things in different situations. And uh, I think, in a, you know, you and I are kind of working together in the technology field in, in the work you're doing with Alchemy. Uh, how do you, when you look at the team that that, that's being built at your company today. Um, how do you feel leadership is displayed when sometimes you're not necessarily face-to-face -face or in-person and hybrid work? How, give us just some pointers on leadership in this, this new, new age. Yeah, you ask a great question. You know, leadership for a startup company and then, and then particularly leadership for a startup company in the environment that we live in. And so you got a few choices, right? If you're if you're a startup, you have to stack some chips in a certain pile. Where are you going to put them? For my money, a good company stacks their chips on the quality of the product. Like that's the first place you go. So if you're starting a company, you could do a lot of things. You could immediately start marketing. You could you make connections you need to make. You could hire out for a whole well-balanced company. But I think you got to stack your chips a little high first on making your product good because that's going to be the cornerstone of everything. And then I think everything radiates out from that, like a pebble that hits the water. This, there's an awesome product. It does something that's relevant, um, and which is another funny thing because, you know, we, there's so many startups out there and they do a lot of cool things. And haven't you seen a couple of times when someone tells you, uh, pitches you a product, this, this is so amazing. It's so cool. The only thing is it doesn't actually solve a problem that you have. And so you're like, you're going to pass on it or, you know, just watch it, watch it happen and see if it goes anywhere. So a great po a product that's uh, that's relevant. I think that's the first place that uh, you exhibit leadership uh, with as uh, as a founder. Uh, I'd be curious. I don't know if I've asked you this before, but 
when you talk about life lessons and skills and discipline, I've heard some, some leaders talk about how they start their day. Uh, would love to, if you could share, what does Joe Sacchetti do on a <laughs> typical day, even though I know you're moving and shaking all well, over the place? I can't believe you're going to make me give a shout out to the U.S. Navy. But Admiral McRaven, he said, get up and make your bed every morning. And that is brilliant. Um, and so uh, what a great way, you know, he, he said that. And it just became a it became a thing because, you know, it really it really uh, is symbolic of a lot of stuff. I think you want to be well ordered at all times. Uh, and, and you wait, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you just you make your bed that says I'm taking care of this uh, and uh, and there's no turning back. You know, I'm not going to climb back in the bed. Right. And um, and then I, and if anyone comes and expe- inspects what I'm doing in my life, they're going to they're going to see a made bed. And all these examples don't really have anything to do with making a bed. They have to do with like what the rest of, you know, what your life uh, represents. But I'll tell you this, after I get out of that bed, me personally, uh, that's workout time. Because I don't think you can be successful in this world talking to people and moving and shaking and doing all that without feeling, you know, feeling the energy. You have to, you have to feel good about yourself. And um, the military spends years with guys that, uh, you know, that, that need to walk tall and 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 do you know like superhuman things so uh i like to keep that down so i i make that bed and then i i get a workout in and and you know get ready to face the day that's great yesterday i i interviewed someone whose business is called mind body and spirit and your book is called guts smart and love so amongst those six words we're covering some good ground today yeah right? Yeah, uh, you're running the gamut. It's awesome. Joe, I, I, I saw in your profile, you've talked to me about traveling. I know we've caught you working remotely. I not caught you in a bad way, but seen you working remotely and kind of making the best of, of this remote environment um, that, the, that the world allows for today. But it says that you've been to over 130 countries. Talk to me a little bit about your love for travel. Is that something that predated your your military service or kind of came from it or followed it and and what does traveling mean to joe sacchetti well i probably loved it before i got to the army and i just didn't know it or i didn't didn't have enough money to do it or you know didn't have the time uh but sure you know in the army um there used to be this funny phrase and it's not politically correct so i don't espouse it but i will tell you it used to be on t-shirts it said you know join the army, you know, travel to exotic places and meet wonderful and crazy exotic people. And they used to say on the bottom and kill them. So, but besides the bottom part, like that's what you, you get exposed to in the military. You get to, you get to see things. It's an eye opener. I think the first couple of times that I stepped foot outside the U S I realized that the the world is this amazing place um, of, uh, of dancing and music and food and culture and, and all kinds of great stuff. So I, uh, I, I got this love to, to be able to see it. And uh, it's nice that the army got me started and then uh, the blessings of a good uh, career. I've, I've used, uh, usually looked for jobs that involve some type of travel, you know, covering Latin America or, or, or working in, in Europe as well. Um, and then what you said, in this environment now, you can work remotely from home. And so, um, I know we, we've been on calls together where I was in Oman or Kuwait, you know, wherever. Um, and uh, it does say one thing, though, you, you know, and everyone may not want to do this, but I do. I blur the personal life and the work together. They, they you know, they, they sort of blend together. Uh, for me, this is a cell phone. I only have one. A lot of guys have two or three on the hip, whatever, that would never work for me. I got to, well, my life has to be ordered. Also, I'm talking to you on my my laptop. I have one laptop. Um, and so I've got, you know, keep everything together. Uh, and you find a way to blend the work and the life together. Hopefully you enjoy both and, it, and it's a good blend. The work you're doing today at Alchemy, uh, I, I describe you as head of partnerships, channel partnerships. But if I, if your LinkedIn profile has it correctly, it describes you as a channel chief. And I'm curious if that is uh, playful to your background as a captain and in the army, or tell us what channel chief means to you and to the company. Well, you're right. It is a little playful. Uh, and uh, 
it's kudos to the company I work for, Alchemy, that uh, they're okay with me having that on my on my profile. That tells you a lot, right? That uh, that they don't take themselves too seriously, and they realize you're, you know, this is a, it's a good place to be. Channel Chief really sort of says, "Hey, uh, there's some things under my command, and what they are 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 partnerships." Uh, it's you know, channel for our listeners that may not know uh, is really synonymous with. Uh, in the selling environment, having partners. Some partners sell your product, some collaborate with you, some are alliances that sell what they sell and you sell what you sell, but you're, you're swimming you know, in the same direction. And so uh, uh, all of those things uh, come from, from that word channel that just mean you know, a, way to, a way to get to your stuff. Uh, and it's pretty awesome in the, in the early days in a, um, uh, in a startup, you've got a lot of different kinds of partners. Uh, partners that are ambassadors that that speak about your product that are sold on it uh, that that resell it that that align with you. Uh, there's some technical folks that are big big giants out there, and they they like what you're doing. They might even incorporate uh, your product in in their much larger solution. So there's a world of things to do out there in the in the channel world. And I would say I'll tell you that you probably need somebody that that thinks of himself as a channel chief to be able to you know, to be able to go attack it all. I can't do it all, but at least I can, I know what there is that needs to be done. We can figure it out. And then we take a team approach and go, go attack it one at a time. And ultimately when you identify a potential partner, wherever it lands in those descriptions and you're excited and you speak to them, how do you then take it from a Joe initiative or Joe's team partnership team initiative and bring that into other leadership or decision makers within the org so that the company understands how a partnership fits into product development or sales or other elements of stuff that's going on. That's a great question because I think one of the key early factors to whether a company will be successful or not is how synchronized all the departments within the company uh, are to each other. And in my case, since I'm a channel guy, I, I see things in a, in a channel viewpoint. So the success of a company is going to be how sy uh, synchronized the other departments. You mentioned product. That's a great, that's a great one. Marketing. Um, the, the data science or the back end engineers, how synchronized are they to accept that a new partner that they never heard of last month is now on board? Well, the, the good company will say, all right, this is great. I now realize that this partner who's interested in working with us is good with A, B and C and I'll, and I'll accept them in and, and start to work, with, uh, work together. And I'm, you know, you know that already there's a, just a ton of different kind of partners. They sort of equally distribute and sprinkle out through the company. And the smart company will will take all those partners and uh, and make their product better. And then ultimately, when you have that partner, you get the internal support from product, from sales, from leadership. What ultimately have you seen as some good elements of what on the other side, both internal and external, what makes a good partnership? Some of the kind of typical mistakes people make versus what you've seen as like amazing examples that this was a successful partnership and this is the reason why. What are just some attributes or, or things to look, look for to avoid almost in the partnership realm? Well, another great question. Uh, and you, I love how you co couched it. You said, what are the internal things and what are the external things? The external thing I'll hit first because it's easy for another, for a partner to be successful with you, they have there has to be something really palpably in it for them. It, it has there has to be mutual success, um, and uh, they, they've got to have something to be able to contribute and something to be able to gain from it. And so, uh, having a partnership that that doesn't really offer that much to your partner is never going to last. It's got to be you know really juicy and really exciting. Uh, in fact, something that their own company can grow. They could they could theoretically hire five or ten more people just because of your partnership. And it doesn't matter what you sell. If you have that going for you, that partner is going to be wildly successful and wildly uh, amenable to, to working with you. Now, on the internal side, it's incumbent upon a company to, make, uh, to, to cover their bases. They have to make partners want to work with them. Uh, and I've devoted a little time when I was at uh, uh, 
business school. I was lucky enough to to go to MIT Business School because they were they were taking Rangers or they took a couple of military guys. They let me in, uh, but it, it, it took some time to put together what I think is important uh, to answer your question directly. And I call them the six pillars. You have to have pillars of success. You have to have a product that's bulletproof and easy to package. Some companies don't. If you don't, what's a partner going to do? It's going to be tricky. You have to uh, offer great margins because no partner gets out of bed for single digit margins. It's not going to work. We've seen it in history where big giant companies slowly whittled their margin down. So you only made 6% if you sold them. Guess what? They, no one's, no one's going to be excited about that. So you have to uh, offer 20, 25% margins in order for people to be excited. A number and something else, you have to make it very easy to sell uh, and give them the repository of all the knowledge that, that, they, that they thirst for. So if you, you need training and certification or you have to give your own people to be able to, to, to train them. And then there's a few more of these pillars. But the point is, you've got to uh, you've got to check the block on all the internal things uh, like uh, reinvestment, marketing collateral and, and so forth like that uh, to make it uh, make it really desirable for a partner to not walk over to you, but come running over to you. Yeah. And, 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 and related to satisfaction on, on having the idea for the partnership, working it externally, internally, seeing it come to fruition, what is like in your seat, what either defines success or makes a channel chief type of role happy, uh, seeing what happened? Like what actually has to happen for you to wake up in the morning and be like, wow, that was a great partnership. Yeah, when you first meet a partner and then you discuss the potential to work together and then you and you, you see it. Oh, this is great. I'm good at this. You're good at that. I think we go well together. Uh, and then you find a mutual customer that actually wants that. You put it in play. You sell it. You're everybody's happy. I mean, you've made money and the customer that you sold it, sold it to is going to be become much better. Uh, everybody wins. And it's literally like running off the field. Uh, together after the after the whistle goes off, you've you've won that game, and then you just can't wait to win another. And so that that's like the ultimate. What makes you happy? Yeah. Just piling up the wins. One thing that I've always enjoyed in terms of our exchanges is, as a business developer, we're constantly thinking of bringing people or parties together. Uh, we call that introductions, connections, making connections, being a connector, all, all things of the sort. Um, with respect to your outreach, initial outreach, I think it stands out from many, many people that, that I work with and deal with. What do you, what, what do you, what's your approach to an initial conversation by email and how do you approach that? I won't give away... Uh, how you do it, but, or, or what it is, but how do you describe that initial response when someone like me were to say, Joe, you know, meet Paul, Paul has this, he could be a potential partner. How do you, what, what do you, what does Joe step into next okay. uh, in, in his process? You're right. I, that's a good question. I do think of these four things. Um, one, uh, the approach, uh, I try to be humble, but memorable. Um, you got to be memorable because that someone doesn't even, you know, if, if you don't get the retention and, and, you know, it's, they're going to go on to the next thing they have to do. Uh, I think it's, uh, important to immediately add some type of value, give something, I mean, say something that's, that actually could help them. Um, not, don't put it off till later, uh, do a little homework to uh, add some value right away. Uh, and then the last piece is, this is just my fun thing because I love to do it. I love people is make a connection. Find some little connection. I mean, there's got to be one. We're both right. human beings. We both live on the East Coast. And then a lot of times, maybe you both are like a, a sports team. Maybe you both like to ski. I mean, there's going to be something out there. And guess what? LinkedIn connects us all together. You can see who you're friends with. I mean, you've got a chance. If you've lived a decent life uh, and, and seen a lot of people, you've traveled around. You've got a wealth of experiences. I mean, you're, you know so many people. You're going to have something in common. So those little four things to make the fun connection, add value, uh, be memorable. And then I guess the, the parentheses is um, just don't take yourself too seriously. Try to be humble. I think as a follow up to that, those four points, we should create a little content around uh, kind of the intro hack by told by Joe and 
and John, so to say, uh, because I actually take pride as well in doing uh, unique or customized outreach that's really tailored to who's on the other side. I think it goes a long way. I've had success. And, and I think being, you know, from at least my seat, very responsive, as you know, in mm -hmm. the partnership world or the sales world, uh, if you don't move, you may lose. And people sometimes can't handle the pace, but that's also a good tell if you were to work with them in a partnership format, what to expect. If they take two weeks to respond or an agreement takes two months, there's a very good chance that upon partnering that it's not going to be smooth sailing. So the courting process tells you a lot in a partnership. Yeah, from my seat, I, I don't know how you feel about it. I totally do. In fact, uh, I guess if you would add a fifth one, uh, and you know this because we we literally make a game out of it, it's that immediate response. They don't let anything sit for a day. It's cold, like food sitting out on the counter. And so uh, we, I, I see a lot of you know your communications, and two things always stand out when I see a note or an email come from John Fishman. One that is authentic. I never get the impression that I've seen that note that you sent to someone, so a prospect, to yep. anyone else, uh, which is why it's so fun to read because it's personalized. It's, so, it's something real. Um, you, you would never have a template and just like put, plug in and take out Hi John and now make it Hi Jeff. The funny thing is I do have templates. I never <laughs> used them. That, that, that's like my, my, uh, my issue is I have these templates that I've had different people help me build I just still, every time it comes down to sending something, I can't ever turn to it because it's never really a good fit for the situation. Your extemporaneous emails are so great. It's a message that actually draws you in. Um, so uh, it's, it, that's the, one of the things. I, it's, it's authentic. Uh, and also, it's, um, it, it's, it's interesting. You connect with people. And uh and so the, 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 the proof in the pudding is the response rate that you get. I mean, you know, um, you get a response rate. People don't ignore your messages. And that's got to mean something. It's, yeah. It comes from uh, being real and adding value and all that. So uh, that's yeah. why it's fun to work with you. And Joe, I, I do think these conversations, as we were kind of joking about before we went live, you and I talk, other people you talk with, I talk with. It's just a nice feeling to share some of the magic that we share one on one with others, right? Whether one person, five people, a hundred people listen to these to this conversation or others, we're putting our stories and our our personal connection in the market, and I think that's what's most exciting about about doing this. And uh, for for a long time, I've I've said, oh, I want to have a podcast, I want to do this. You can make yourself crazy thinking about what it is, what it isn't. And one of my close friends used to say, you just got to start the process. And jokingly, when I look at this background image, uh, with, I, I, I'm confident saying a week, a month, a year from now, it will look different, maybe not. Uh, but the, the authenticity of the conversations, I imagine, will, be, uh, will continue. And uh, so I would say, are there any final kind of takeaways or points that you think you don't have, it's not every day that you, you get to share. I know you've covered a lot. Gut Smarts and Love is a book that tells, uh, that's available on Amazon, right, Joe? There yeah, you I just, go. I just happen to have it right here. <laughs> that was the book I used when I was in away over Christmas and we had to reserve chairs at 7 a.m. Okay. Uh, I put down the Gut Smarts and Love book to set the tone. And no one's going to mess with that. No one's going to mess with someone, you. Someone did mess with it, but <laughs> that was the day I, I didn't leave the book out. So <laughs> if you buy the book, it's a good Christmas uh, read and a good, uh, uh, anyway. So no, Joe, any final final yeah. words or, or thoughts? Your, your last point is beautiful about sharing. Um, I think it's, you know, if you've got something to say, why not share it? We live in an environment now where someone doesn't want to listen to you. They just won't tune in. Uh, but, but it's out there for someone who does want to listen to. Uh, and I have, uh, I have an Aunt Lucille. Uh, you know, probably every Italian has an Aunt Lucille somewhere. Uh, and, uh, and she doesn't get to travel and do stuff, but she loves when I share stuff with her. If I do something, I share it. I put it on Facebook or something and she makes her so happy. I think there's so, a lot of So we, we, we're, I'm confident saying we will have someone on the analytics viewing it up to 30 minutes. There's a good chance it's Aunt Lucille. 
So Aunt <laughs> Lucille, you got a great uh, nephew here. Good man. I love working with him. I know we'll be, we're friends now, but I imagine we'll be friends for a long time. And hopefully some of what we're working on, on the partnership front and customer front at Alchemy will come together nicely. Any kind of, also maybe just like one couple sentences on Alchemy, just so uh, the universe that's listening has a sense on, on what you're doing day to day. Yeah, Alchemy is a great company. It's a startup company that uh, offers a, a SaaS, which is software as a service, uh, does data extraction. And, and that's in, in the artificial intelligence world, automating things. So if you've got targeted data that you want to get, but it's just in the middle of thousands and thousands of sheets and documents of paper, you can pull it out there. And we're really smart these days. And it's a, it's a company that's got a great platform. It finds data and it applies it to where it's got to go, which is usually the financial industry, the real estate industry, insurance, stuff like that. And it's got a great application. We're saving thousands of human, uh, manual human hours of work uh, so that they can do more, you know, the things that are better uh, for the company and themselves. So we will, uh, we'll wrap up here, Joe, really appreciate you uh, spending time today. Uh, and uh, anyone in my universe that wants to brainstorm further about meeting Joe, working with Joe and Alchemy, feel free to, uh, to reach out to either of us. And we'd, we'd love to talk further on, on the busy dev Alchemy front. All right, Joe, have a good one. Thanks so much. Thank you, John.